One of the ways that Jesus often taught spiritual truths was through the use of parables. A parable is really just a story, a story designed to convey a principle or an idea in order to teach something. And one of the parables that Jesus used was the parable of the ten virgins. It's one of the parables told by Jesus regarding the kingdom of heaven. And it's actually been used in the past by many different people. It's been used and thought of as a fearful thing. I've heard preachers say, you'd better watch out, you'd better be afraid, because Jesus could return at any moment, and if you're not careful, you could be left behind. I've heard that countless times by many different people. You may have heard it as well. Now I will readily admit that there is a warning in the parable of the ten virgins. But to turn what Jesus said into a fear-mongering sermon would be a perversion of what Jesus is actually saying here. Because not only did he give a warning, but he also gave amazing words of life. Words that would make it so that you do not have to be afraid. You don't have to fear. And what I want to share with you today is the amazing truth about the parable of the ten virgins and how it all really revolves around Jesus himself. By seeing this truth, we don't need to be in needless fear any longer. Welcome to Thriving Branch. I'm Jim. T today we are taking a look at the parable of the ten virgins, a parable told by Jesus regarding the kingdom of heaven and meant to convey truths. And as we'll see today, truths that are actually about himself, about what he came to do, about what he has done for us today. And there is a warning in this parable. And as I said, there's also amazing words of life. The warning may not be what you expect it to be. Because as I said, many people have tried to turn this parable into something that breeds fear. And I think that's very sad. But let's begin today by reading the parable itself found in Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 through 13. So we're going to read the entire parable. Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 through 13. Let's read it together. Ready? One, two, read. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins which took their lamps, and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, 
And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. So what do we see here? Jesus says in verse 1 that he is telling a story. Remember, a parable is just a story. He's telling a story designed to show truths about the kingdom of heaven. Now, we studied the kingdom of heaven previously, so I'm not going to go into that here, but I'll put a link to that study if you're interested in that. And Jesus here proceeds to tell about the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five who were foolish. We see in verses 3 and 4 that the five foolish virgins took lamps, but took them without oil. In contrast, the five wise virgins took their lamps with oil. You see, the wedding custom of the day was for the bride and her guests to be entertained at the bride's house until the coming of the groom, and then proceed in a festive wedding procession lit by the light of the lamps, and be received at the groom's house for further festivities. This usually happened at night, hence why they needed the lamps, as was customary. So the lamps were used as part of the wedding procession to light the way, and it also was, it was nice, and it was bright, and it was fun. And we see in verse 5, something is keeping the groom. He is later than what would normally be expected. And the virgins fell asleep. But then in verse 6, we see at midnight, they were woken up by the shouts of the messengers saying, He's here! Go out to meet him! And in verse 7, they all wake up and begin trimming their lamps. And trimming just means they're preparing their lamps to be lit. They're making sure they don't give off black smoke, etc. Anyone who has used an oil lamp before will understand what trimming is. And if you want to know about trimming, there are tons of websites telling you about trimming your oil lamp, how to do it, what it means. And in verse 8, we see that the foolish virgins, now having freshly trimmed their lamps, are realizing that without oil, <laughs> their lamps are constantly going out. Their lamps are going out. And they ask for some oil from their wise counterparts. But in verse 9, we see that they are denied. So what is all of this? What's going on here exactly? What's the point that Jesus is trying to make? Well, Jesus said that this parable, these ten virgins, are all like the kingdom of heaven. The story is meant to convey a spiritual truth about the kingdom of heaven. We know that the virgins represent the church. We know that from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Mark chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, so on and so forth. And we also know that the church is the assembly of believers, the people, not a physical building. And we know that from Acts chapter 7, verses 48 to 50, and Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Third, we know that the oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And we know that from Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, and Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. So with these basic elements in place, we can begin to see the truth about what Jesus is saying, particularly about himself. He's actually conveying a manifold bit of wisdom here, a multi-layered truth, one for his immediate audience 
and one for us today as well. And this isn't the first or the only time that Jesus does this either. His wisdom is always manifold. His wisdom is always multi-layered. Jesus is always accomplishing more than what it seems. And to understand this better, we can consider the Old Covenant sacrifices, such as in Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, which Jesus, of course, completely fulfilled, but it shows us another aspect of truth in him. Let's look at it really quick, because I want you to see this. I want this all to come together for you like puzzle pieces. You have one piece over here, you have one piece over here, and when you put them together, you find out they fit, and you see the entire picture clearer. So let's look at Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, really quick. Hold your place here in Matthew chapter 25, though, because we will come back to it. Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Let's read it together. Ready? One, two, read. And when any will offer a meat offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it, and put frankincense thereon. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take out of there his handful of the flour thereof, and of the oil thereof, and with all the frankincense thereof, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it on the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet smell to the Lord. And the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. So at first you might be thinking, this doesn't fit at all. But what we can see here is one of the requirements when making a grain offering and remember, Jesus' body is the absolute fulfillment of the grain offering, of all the offerings, really. And one of the requirements here is to pour oil on it, and it is to be burned. Now, these requirements have never really changed, but the difference today is that Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, has been offered. His body has been broken. His spirit has been given. Why is the spirit of Christ so very essential to proper offering? Well, for much the same reason as the oil is also necessary for the lamps in the parable. His spirit is the catalyst for everything of God in our lives. His Spirit produces all of the fruit. His Spirit allows our union and communion with Christ. His Spirit leads us. His Spirit guides us into all truth and reminds us of everything that Jesus has said to us. Without His Spirit, we really have nothing. It's His Spirit that testifies that we are the children of God and reminds us that we are righteous in Him. Without His Spirit, we have no assurance for salvation. So as we return to the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25, with this information in mind, we see in verses 8 and 9 that the foolish virgins ask the wise virgins for some oil but they are denied. The wise virgins tell the foolish ones to go where oil is sold and buy some for yourselves. Now this may seem like a put off at first, but it is actually the most gracious and the best counsel that anyone could ever give. Today in the new covenant of grace in Christ Jesus, there is only one place where the Spirit of God can be obtained as mentioned in Zechariah 4. The Spirit obviously comes from Jesus himself, and there is also only one price to be paid for his Spirit, and Jesus already paid it. Again, it is himself, his sacrifice, which restores to us 
the union with Christ and what was lost way back there in the garden. So the focus here is placed squarely where it needs to be, on the finished work of Christ. Not on man's strength, not on man's efforts, or on man's wisdom. None of ourselves, but all on Jesus. Now, as Jesus would tend to do, as I mentioned, his words here carry a manifold meaning. They're multi-layered. One meaning is for his immediate audience, the Jews who were under the old covenant, which was about to change as Christ fulfilled it and ushered in the new covenant. And there is also a secondary meaning for the Gentiles and for the church assembly today as well, for us. The first meaning was for the Jews, those under the Old Covenant. And sadly, there are still many under the Old Covenant today. His meaning for them was the warning, because they would cling to and hold on to the Old Covenant, which did indeed have glory, but its glory was ending in Christ. We know that from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9-11. through 11. They could no longer hang on to the old ways and the old system because the covenant was changing in Christ. He was fulfilling it. He was ushering in the new covenant founded on better promises himself. And we see this in the parable because it mentions their lamps were going out. The glory was ending. And there's also a meaning here for the Gentiles and the church today. And there's a little bit of a warning here too, because this also means that a person cannot simply leech off of someone else's relationship with Christ. What do I mean by that? You see, we each should have our own union and relationship with Christ by his Spirit. There are a lot of people who run around following after other leaders, other teachers, other ministers, because they covet the spirit in that person's life. And these people try to leech off of that one person, not realizing that in the end, only your own personal union with Christ is what matters. Someone else's oil cannot actually save you. You need to have your own oil. And that comes from your own personal relationship with Jesus, having his spirit work in your life. I'm not saying it's bad to learn from other people. We're supposed to encourage one another in Christ. Sadly, there isn't much of that going on today, but that's what we should be doing. We should be building up one another. We should be encouraging one another in Christ. That means I should be encouraging you to be built up in Christ. And that's my intention in every single one of these studies, is I want to encourage you in your relationship with Christ, not in rules and regulations and laws, but in your relationship with Christ. That is the only thing that matters. Your union with Christ by his spirit to build you up, to make you strong so that you can stand and so that you can bless others and so that you can, most importantly, have a personal relationship with a personal God who loves you beyond your wildest imagination. That being said, you also need to understand that my relationship with Christ on its own cannot save you. Friend, I love you in Christ very much, but my personal relationship with God is exactly that, mine. My relationship with God cannot save you, but what I can do is encourage you to have your own personal relationship with God, your own union with Christ. And my desire is that your relationship with him becomes even greater than my own. And a relationship with God, a union with Christ through his spirit, is so much more than what we have made it out to be today. 
strange legalistic and ritualistic practices, learning Bible trivia, and just focusing on interesting scripture factoids that give us the appearance of wisdom. That's what many people seek after today. And all of that stuff really is worshiping knowledge about God instead of God himself. And all the people who are chasing after that have empty lamps without oil. In verses 10 through 13 of our text, we see that the foolish virgins missed the appointment and were told by the groom that he doesn't know them. And this again goes to the heart of the issue. It's the union, the relationship. See, knowing Bible trivia, knowing facts mean nothing without the union, without the relationship. This right here goes to the heart of the issue again. It's the union, the relationship. In the end, he either knows you personally or he doesn't. This isn't about facts. This isn't about knowledge. This isn't about trivia or friendship by association. You won't be able to name drop your pastor, your friend, or anyone else to get you by. You can't say, oh, I, I, I know the other guy that you know. That won't work. This is all about your personal relationship with God. As I said in the opening of the study today, there is a warning here. But it's not one that you need to be in fear or doubt about. Because the way to avoid the warning, if you, you want to have a proper relationship with Jesus, is to have the oil for your lamp. This is not a shotgun wedding that's being spoken of here. You have a choice to be prepared and a part of the festival, a part of the wedding procession, or not? If so, if that's what you want, if you want to be a part of the wedding, if you want to have this union with Christ, you now know where to get the oil. And you now know always how to keep your lamp burning bright. Again, it's found in Zechariah chapter 4, and I will end the study today with the words from Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That is how you have the oil. That is how you keep your lamp burning bright. It's not by your efforts not by your power, but by his spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And the good news, my friend, is that Jesus finished the work. He made the sacrifice, and he has sent his spirit. If you want his spirit today, if you want that union, all you need to do is ask for it right now. And I'm not going to tell you what to say, because I want it to be your words. I want it to be coming from your heart. I want the request to be genuine. But you can ask him right now. Receive from Christ. Trust in him, and your lamp will never go out. Be blessed.